the YouTube, I mean. Uh, in addition, I've, I've notated a few areas in Chapter 5 that we're totally going to bypass. So, um, you, you know, and you'll, so if you see that, That was strange. I start lecturing, she takes off. Anyway, so um, right now, you know, a couple of you guys asked me before I hand it out or before I published homework six, well, are we going to have to turn it in on Friday? And I said no. But you know what I think we're going to do? We're going to turn it in on Monday with the exam. So have it with you, you know. And it'll be, it's just going to be a study problem. And it will be pre-graded, you know, as I said. Uh, but I have to know who to give a grade to. So uh, you'll turn that in uh, for your pre-graded value of eight. So I'll try to get that up tonight. You know, all of our homework problems, boy, we are, there's a lot of people absent today. I wish I had more clicker questions. Yeah, I... I Anyway, um, my my moment of vindictiveness is over. Uh, anyways, um, all the homework problems, if you think about it, are study problems and practice problems. The ones that I assign as written homework, and the ones that I just say, okay, I like these problems. Uh, uh, so th th think of all of those things as prepping for each exam as we go. And even though it might not explicitly be on the exam, it'll still probably help you uh, make decisions uh, in the exam, you know, having done some homework. Okay, Abraham Lincoln. All right, last time we talked about the exam two plan revision up to chapter 6.2. Um, Pre-graded homework six, I already discussed that. We also talked about terminal velocity. You know, I had some friends in grad school that uh, rode around and uh, they love to build and fly these ultralight air. Anybody have been in an ultralight airplane? Man, nobody. An ultralight is, a, is an airplane kind of like you see in a James Bond movie, you know, where he's up there in this little, this little thing made of tubes steel tubes and he's got you know rotors in the front and back and stuff and he's he's shooting down specter or whatever you know with laser beams or something like that uh it's an ultralight plane it's very small like a lawnmower engine just about uh and a prop and very light you know it, you know what it is it's like a hang glider a little bit more than a hang glider with a motor and a prop and those guys have to have what we call ballistic parachutes and, uh, you know, the, the parachute, you know, is, it affects terminal velocity too. You know, we talked about terminal velocity last time. You know, I see, you know so the, you, you jump out of the airplane and your feet down for a minute until you kick out into spread eagle. Then you slow down a little bit. And then, or if you go into a tuck, you know, you can maybe go a little bit faster if you're like Arnold Schwarzenegger jumping out of a jet something, you know, to try to get to New York City and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, any skydiver eventually is going to pull the ripcord. And the ripcord, of course, increases the surface area, you know, that big canopy. Uh, and that, it, that means that your terminal velocity is even smaller. So you're going to slow down to terminal velocity and, uh, and reassume. So... This is a ballistic parachute uh, that, you know, they first developed them for ultralights, but now they have them for regular planes. So you can see that's a little Cessna-type airplane there. Look, look carefully at that. You can see the propeller. That engine is stopped. You know why I know that? Because the parachute is pretty much directly overhead. So it's not towing the parachute. You know, like you might see with somebody that's 
paragliding or something like that, you know, on skis. This guy's just dropping down the desert floor. It's amazing to think about. And they can, they can make them as big big enough to handle a 747. I don't know, you know, what that would entail, but it's small enough on a, a Cessna type plane that it's practical. So it's pretty nice. And those were developed at NASA. Ballistic parachutes, kind of a cool image. All right, clicker question about a 10 kilogram bag of potatoes. Uh oh, gram bag of potatoes. Here's your first question. Calculate the weight. This should be as easy as eating a piece of pumpkin pie. All right, now, so then select the tens part of your answer and, and bub or uh, type in the, oh, you know what? I have to hit the refresh key. I have to give you a short answer on that. Hit your refresh key and start it again. Yeah, so this, this will allow you to encode uh, numerals one through nine and zero for the tens part of your answer. And we're just doing practice because this is what we're going to do on the exam. And, of course, there's some people here right now that are not, excuse me, there's some people that are not here right now, but they will be on Monday for the exam. They're going to be. They're going to be blooping and scooping. Okay, 30 seconds. This calculation you can do in your head, I think. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, okay, so let's see what we got here. Um, did you vote for AE? It looks like 88% of you did. So that's good. All right. Next question. Uh, select the units part of your answer. Go. And then don't forget to hit the send key. If you press refresh, just type your answer in. It's only one or two letters, so. But just remember to hit the send key. This is kind of weird using clickers to teach about scam. <laughs> you know, you know people still get this one. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Okay, stop. Yeah, you guys did good. Uh, correct answer is, uh, you know, 98 newtons. So this, the uh, 8 is encoded by AD. All right, so just to remind you, that's how we're going to encode calculations. We might have one or two calculations. Uh, you know, it's, and actually, we may have more than that, but I'll, I'll usually put some simple Cinchy calculations directly into a multiple choice. But if I want you to do the calculation and give me your number, we'll do it this way instead of just checking your paper and stuff. So this will be the bottom line calcul the bottom line grading and it'll it'll go by Scantron. Hopefully you get it. Uh, so um, 
All right, let's uh, push forward into chapter six, uniform circular motion and gravitation. Uh, we won't get to gravitation. We'll just get to chapter 6.2 today. Matter of fact, that's where we're going to start. And then we'll dip backwards to chapter 6.1 when we finish. Okay, curve trajectories in general, uh, I want to go over a few things about them. And then we'll specify to the idealized uniform circular motion, which is a circular path. So go ahead and draw yourself kind of a curvaceous path like mine. Make them with two curves, one to the right, one to the left, uh, different, different sharpness, you know, one more gradual than the other if you, you can. Now, on the curved path, one thing you can, you can know for certain is you're changing direction, all right, no matter what. I mean, you may have the speedometer set to, you know, cruise control at 25 miles an hour, okay, but if you're on a curved path, you're at least changing direction. So your velocity arrow, even if it's the same length on cruise control, uh, 25 miles per hour, you're still going to be changing. It's going to be changing direction only, not its length. You know, so if you're on cruise control, your length is set, and you could do a curve. You know, you could do a path like this. You know, on, you know, 25 or whatever. Okay, now the acceleration vector is going to exist. All right, so the acceleration vector exists because the velocity arrow is changing. All right now, it may not be changing the speed, you know, so it may not be giving you a positive acceleration or a slowdown, negative acceleration, but it is giving you a steering acceleration. And that's something I want to reinforce with you that um, just changing the direction of the velocity vector is enough to say that you're accelerating uh, the object. Because there's an acceleration on the velocity vector, there's going to be a delta V over delta T of some kind. There will also be a net force, F equals MA. So you can't, you can't run this course in a car with tires made of Teflon on a road made of ice because you won't have any gription you know, for the tires, they've got to, you know, the road surface has got to give you some grip force, you know, reaction uh, to, to get you to stay on the road if you're on the curve, all right? And that's where the forces come from, all right? Now, at each curve, there's a radius of curvature, possibly more than one. Now, if you go to the, uh, you know, I was looking at the news last night, and they were going all about the Daytona 500 and stuff, and I, I remember looking at their, the overhead plan of the Daytona uh, Super Speedway, they have three turns uh, and very precisely measured radius, radii of curvature. All right, so I'm going to show you what that looks like. Go ahead and put a dot on one of your turns. Um, and I've got my red dot up here. And what we're going to do is sketch in the velocity vector at this point. All right. So it could be any point. This is the one I'm choosing up here. So th at this point, um, you know, we're going to have a velocity vector and a radius of curvature. We're going to try to sketch in both of those babies. Now, the velocity is tangent to the curve. It's tangent to the path, all right? And so drawing a tangent line, kind of sketch it in, and then put an arrow. There's my – we'll say that he's going – from the left side of the curve to the upper right side of the curve. So there's the velocity, and it can be any length that you want. There's nothing special about that in this diagram anyways. All right. So that's my velocity at this instant of time on the track. Now, if I'm a little bit later down toward the straightaway, uh, let me get my cursor over here. Uh, if I'm over here by the straightaway, yeah, that's all right. You know, we'll have a different velocity vector. But right here, it's the velocity is always tangent to the path, even if it's a straight line path. You know, it's parallel to the path. All right. Now let's move this out of here. All right. All right. And let's start thinking about the radius of curvature. Now, for at least a short length of time, and a short distance, this imaginary circle 
is going to be right along the actual pavement, the actual path. All right. Now I've got it backed a couple inches away from the roadway in this diagram. So let me put it right in there. All right, there it is. And just kind of gracefully try to trace in a circle that just at the, at the dot, that, that location that you've chosen, uh, just gracefully matches it just, and it's an eyeball thing. I mean, you know, if I had a, if I had a, you know, a big, uh, polynomial equation or some other kind of trig equation for the path, then I could generate the circles exactly. But for this, we're just eyeballing it. All right. So, so there's my radius. And, and actually that's my circle of cur curvature. So it matches the path if only for a few meters. And the center of the circle is inside the turn, what we would call inside, all right? In fact, that defines the idea of inside the turn, right? The center of curvature, right? Now, the velocity vector as before is tangent to the path. It's also tangent to this circle at this red dot. Now, it won't be tangent any other place on the circle, but at this point, yes. That is how you draw in the, um, the circle for the radius of curvature. All right, so that's a general path. Now, a circular path has exactly one radius of curvature, okay? And that's the radius of the circle. But for a path like this, you know, it's it's going to vary a little bit and that's all right. You can, you know, you, in, you instinctively handle it as you drive. And it's, it's amazing how, how powerful the human brain is. The things that you can do, Matt, just by instinct, you know, just by visual recognition, you know, little babies, you know, they got this, everybody's afraid of Facebook uh, facial recognition software stuff and, and Bill, no, not Bill Gates. Mark Zuckerberg is spying on you through Facebook and he has facial recognition. So he knows kind of like Santa Claus. He knows who's naughty and who's nice. <laughs> Supposedly, that's what they say. But I, you know, I d highly doubt he's, he's probably got crap software, but he's happy to let everybody think it's really good because facial recognition is not easy. It is very difficult. And you need big computers to do it. But guess what? what? Like a day or two after you were born, you're a little teeny shrimpy baby, you know, going around wetting your diapers and stuff like that and sleeping and, and basically, you know, and, and eating. And that's about it. Now, so you're like two, you're two, you're two days old. But here's the cool thing. In two days, you can all, already recognize your mom's and your dad's face. It's amazing how powerful the mind is. That's just a little baby. You know, and I'll guarantee you, everybody in here, you have no idea the powers that you have. Just in, in terms of visual recognition. You think you get a feeling, you know, like, ooh, this is creepy, or that guy's a perv, or something like that. But really... It's, it's probably something that you see and you don't realize that you're seeing it, but your brain recognizes it, you know, back in the back part of your brain. And I, I guarantee you, you know, this is like, this is like teaching. I always think about this, you know, thinking about your powers. It's like teaching at Professor Xavier's school for, what is that? What's the name of it? Extraordinary. Ex extraordinary youngsters. Everybody in here has extraordinary powers because of this blob of stuff at the top of your spinal column. And, you know, it's, it's something, you know, nobody knows how many powers they have. It's just, you know, we're always finding out new stuff. Now, let's talk about the acceleration and the net force. 
the it, if if we go through this course at a constant speed, so like 25 mile per hour cruise control, all right, or 10 miles per hour, nice and easy. You know, you're you're driving your grandma, so you got to go nice and easy, all right. The speedometer is constant. So the acceleration, you know, you, you have an acceleration to change the velocity vector, all right? But it's not speeding you up. If you're on cruise control, you're not getting faster. You're not getting slower. You're just changing the direction. So what that means is the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. It's not barely slanted towards the velocity that would speed it up and turn the direction change the direction. It's not slanted slightly back away from the velocity. That would slow it down a little bit as well as change the direction. If you're on a curve and you're not changing speed, you have a force that is exactly perpendicular because there's no speed up or slow down. And therefore it's because it's exactly perpendicular to the velocity and the velocity is tangent to the path and the velocity is tangent to the imaginary circle, uh, then the acceleration is parallel to the radius of curvature, right? So it goes, it points straight back towards that imaginary center of curvature, right? So it's inside the turn. And this is what changes the direction of the velocity. Now, with that comes a smaller large force, right? You have an acceleration, perpendicular to the velocity, radially inward toward the center of the curvature. And the mass of the object, whatever it is, times that acceleration, that's the size of your force. So you have a, uh, an acceleration and a force toward the center of curvature. So it, it could be, it depends on the speed, you know. So if you're, if you're going at, you know, in this example, 10 miles per hour, but if you speed it up to 25 miles per hour, you know, you got to get your grandma to her bingo game. She's a little bit late. You know, you don't want her getting cranky at the. Did you see that the other day? They had up in Canada. They had some at some nursing home. The bingo. They had a big brawl of all little old ladies. They got crosswise somehow. Had a, I, I just wish I could have seen a video of that at, at a bingo game at a, at a senior citizen center. Unbelievable. So it depends on the speed. The more speed, the more force you're going to need. And think about that. If you have stinky, you know, if your tires are really bald and it's raining, you better know not to go too fast around corners because you're going to start to skid. Those bald surfaces will not give you enough grip to keep your turn. If you have good tires, you can take the turn at a faster speed. So... The tightness of the curve, the speed, all that stuff goes into um, the, the force and the acceleration. So then that force is also toward the center of the turn. Now, I'm going to give you an example now. Uh, we're going to go to the idealization of uniform circular motion. So this is kind of a generalized path. It's kind of squiggly. But now we're going to focus on a real live example, the Nardo ring. This is a circular test track down in the boot heel of Italy. Here's the overhead view from space. In this image, you can see it off in the distance. Here it is. All right, it's a little bit closer. And here's overhead. It's, it's uh, I, be I believe it's the Italian automaker Fiat and a, a lot of European automakers use it for testing cars. Um, so the outermost lane is uh, optimized, you know, it's got some bank and it's optimized for 149 miles per hour optimal speed. And if you're at that speed, you, you just keep the steering wheel straight. So it's like running a car straight ahead, you know, at 149 miles an hour for miles, you know, as many miles as you want on that track. Um, and if you want to go faster, uh, you have to crank it a, a few degrees to stay on the track and increase the gription. 
And you may think to yourself, 149 miles per hour, that's pretty fast. Yeah, but over in Europe, they got the Autobahns. And last I heard the Autobahns, you just go as fast as you, you feel safe, which is how it used to be out west, you know, in Montana, where, where I used to live for a long time. You, they, they had no uh, speed limit during the day because it's just such a large state. So far between towns, you just could drive uh, as fast as you wanted. Then the federales uh, said, oh, well, now you're getting federal funds. you got to have a speed limit. So they said, all right, we'll put the speed limit at 70 during the day. And they, they always had a speed limit at night, unlimited during the day and, and, and you know, 65 or 70 during the night. But they said, but so they, they got forced to, to give a speed limit. So now what they do is they, they have a 70 miles per hour driving limit, but a speeding ticket costs $5. So, so they got it. They got it. They got it fixed up pretty good out there. So effectively, it's still an autobahn out there. Anyway, so the innermost lane. And they have another part of the test track. The innermost lanes for testing trucks and stuff, vans. So 50 miles per hour optimal speed on that one. And if you want to go faster, you have to crank the wheels in. And so that's the Nardo ring, and it's a it's a it's a perfect circle, pretty close, anyways. You can see see it. It looks really good from space. Um, and you know they they have it set so the so at 149 miles per hour on the outer ring, your car's naturally if it has good tires, it's going to provide the perfect centripetal acceleration, the perfect acceleration toward the center of the ring. Here's another picture. And make a note. This is like somebody going around the Nardo ring. Look at the free body diagram. The force F subscript C is the force um, on the car on the car from the roadway. It's a frictional force. You can see it down here. It's mu uh, times the normal force N. Right? So that's frictional force. So you have, have to have good friction in your tires. You can't go through with tires made of banana peels and a roadway made of uh, water, okay, it won't work. Now we're gonna drive two equations uh, on a simple circular path at constant speed, in other words, uniform circular motion. And we're gonna do it with uh, diagrams. So here we go. Go ahead and draw a circular path, okay, Nardo ring. And let's say at time T1, your position is at three o'clock, your radial vector, your position vector is of length r, and it's tilted to the right from the center, 3 o'clock position. Um, and let's say that your velocity is going up. All right, so we're going uh, counterclockwise on the Nardo ring. All right. And so go ahead and just make a sketch like that. Now, let's make another one. A little bit later, time T2, and now you've you've traveled a little bit along the Nardo ring. So now you're at two o'clock position, and your position vector, the black uh, line segment in this case, is at two o'clock, and that means that your you know what that means? That means that the velocity vector v2, it's no longer at it was at 12 o'clock, now it's pointing at 11 o'clock. All right, you see that? All right, so your radial position vectors have changed by 30. And I actually did, I did all this stuff very carefully, so it is 30 degrees. So that second red velocity vector is pointing at 11 o'clock. Now let's get organized here. What we're going to do is we're going to make a triangle out of the two black position radii vectors. All right, so watch how I, I've got this animated. So watch how I do that. I copy the second one onto the tail of the first. All right, so that's a good copy. All right, and I'm just going to park it over here uh, to, the, to the lower left. Now I'm going to do the same thing with my velocities. All right, so there's my copy. All right, so that looks like a good copy. And I'm going to move it up to the upper right. All right, so I have a, a pair of position vectors in black and a pair of velocity vectors in red. So the 
the red velocity vectors, the first one is at 12 o'clock. And now you can see that the second one is pointing to 11 o'clock. All right, it's pretty clear there. Now down here, the black position vectors are three o'clock and two o'clock. All right, now uh, let me move those out of the way and make it a little bit bigger. And what we're gonna do now is connect the base of the position and make a position triangle. And I made it a dotted line, all right? It's important. Now the two black segments of solid black, those are both length R, because they're from the circle. They're radii of the circle. Now this baby over here is the approximate distance that you have traveled uh, between T2, T1 and T2, all right? Now, why is it approximate and not exact? Because you're, you're traveling on a circle and this is not a circular arc, okay? Now we're gonna deal with that in a minute. But, it's so, but approximate distance is good. Now let's do the same thing over here with my red velocities uh, uh, arrows and make a red velocity triangle. All right, now this one up here, um, I've got V and V because it's uniform circular motion. So this is speedometer, you know, setting, whatever it is. And what's that d dashed line? Not a time. It's some, it's what? It's not a direction. Well, kind of it is a direction change, but it itself is not a directional arrow. Those are velocities. What kind of a velocity rated vector is that? Yeah. Is it what? No, it's not. It's not an acceleration vector. It's a velocity related vector. So that was going to be measured in meters per second. Everything in red is meters per second. Not average. Change in velocity. That's delta V up there. All right, so there's your delta V. So what we've got are two similar triangles. The angles are equal, and the sides are proportional. So we can form proportions among the sides, you know, between the distance triangle and the velocity triangle. Austin. It is. No, the velocity is not constant. The speed is. Oh, because it changes direction. Right. Change direction. It, it's not a change in direction because that would be measured with the black triangles. All right. All right. That would be measured on XY graph paper instead of velocity graph paper. Everything in red is on velocity graph paper. All right. Now, let's... Um, Let's put the, oh, I'll just, I went backwards. I'll go through this again fast. Okay. All right. That distance down there, the approximate distance is approximately the speed times delta T. And guess what, my wonderful students? Now we've got a delta T in the mix. It's a dynamic system, it's time, so time is a factor, and we've now got a delta T in there. All right, now it's not exactly delta T, but it's approximately delta T. So here we go. Let's make a proportion, all right? R over V equals V delta T over delta V. So the left side, is the length of the isosceles, oh, by the way, these are isosceles triangles. They're similar isosceles triangles. So the base angles are the same size and stuff like that. Uh, so R over V, that's the isosceles side over isosceles side for the red, is equal to, okay, base for the position triangle divided by base of the velocity triangle. Right, so there's your proportion, and this is the key that locks in the formulas. 
right? So these are the isosceles sides, position triangle divided by speed triangle. And then this is isosceles base, position triangle divided by speed triangle. Let me ask you a question. I want you to look at that proportion. Now, we didn't set it up in any particular way, but let me ask you this. Do you see an acceleration in there? Raise your hand if you see an acceleration. Raise your hand. No. D over R, flip the other one. Yeah, if you flip-flop them, yeah. Then you flip-flop both sides. But what's your point? Wait a minute. Hush now. I'm listening to Rachel. Yeah, there's a delta V over delta T in there. Right here, it's flip-flopped. It's delta T over delta V. We can flip-flop it if we want. How about that? All right, so here we go. Let's do it. Delta V over delta T. And let's park that extra V. This V over here in the top, let's park, let's cross multiply it. So you got R over V squared and then flip flop it. And you'll get delta V over delta T and V squared over R. And now we, we know that the acceleration is toward the center. And if we took the two instants of time, T1 and T2, closer and closer together in time, we'd see that these velocity, the delta V vector is closer and closer to exactly toward the center. But this is our result. The size of the centri and this is a centripetal acceleration, my wonderful students. C E N T R I. P-E-T-A-L. That means toward the center. Centrifugal is a misnomer. Do not ever use centrifugal force. And if you hear me use centrifugal force or centrifugal acceleration, then I'll owe you... I'll owe you, uh, let's see, I don't want to go bankrupt because I do do it sometimes, but I'll owe you some Skittles or something. Uh, Halloween, a fun size Skittles. Okay, I don't want to go broke. Anyway, so, so centrifugal, and the reason it's, now centrifugal is, is a word, it's a normal word and it's a good word. There are certain things called centrifuges. But the meaning of centrifugal is fugal, fugue, F-U-G, fugitive, flee. It flees the center. It, that means centrifugal means it's aimed away from the center. And we already know that the acceleration is toward the center, right, centripetal. All right, so let's, let's kind of sum it up. Because we have proportional triangles, the speed triangle and the position triangle are proportional to each other we have a centripetal acceleration uh, result, V squared over R. And by, by the same token, the F equals MA, the centripetal force is M times V squared over R. So, all right, now, um, I'm gonna indicate a few centripetal force now, actually, I think centripetal acceleration problems from 6.2 for you to, to study over the weekend. And don't forget, I have a lot of annotation. I'm not done annotating Chapter 5. or And I think I have a little bit in Chapter 4 to finish up. All right, now, let's uh, dip backwards to Chapter 6.1. And let's talk about it. This is basically a little bit of a, a vocabulary. Rotation angle. It doesn't depend uh, where you are on the disk. Every, every dot on this disk 
is going to rotate the same number of degrees. Uh, so, but the one thing about it is um, they'll all possibly have different arc lengths. So delta S, the green curve, now we're talking about an arc. Okay, we're not approximating here. That arc, delta S, that's the arc length. Um, that'll trace out different lengths depending on how far away it is. All right, but delta theta is the same. So, so delta theta is equal to the arc length, delta S, whatever that happens to be over R. All right, so for a full uh, revolution, a full circle, the, um, the arc length is 2 pi R. All right, now that's important for us because it helps us to find the radian system of angle measurement. Now, you may have heard that from high school algebra class, trig class and stuff. Yeah, we're going to need it. Uh, so basically, delta theta is arc length um, divided by R. And for one full arc length or for one full revolution, that boils down to 2 pi. And 2 pi is the radian system measurement. Uh, equivalent to 360 degrees. So 180 degrees corresponds to pi radian, 3.14 radians. All right, and you can read more about it uh, in chapter 6.1. All right, so there's the basic formula for that. Okay, and that's kind of, this is kind of nomenclature. I just want to dip you through this a little bit. Uh, another thing I want to do uh, nomenclature-wise is angular velocity. That's just delta theta over delta t. How fast is the disk spinning? So this is like RPMs, all right? So it doesn't depend on position in the disk. So every dot on that CD is traveling at the same omega, at the same uh, angular velocity. The symbol for that is usually omega. Um, and here's the, here's the formula for omega. Let me get my cursor back over here. So omega is delta theta over delta t. And don't forget, delta theta is arc length delta s over r. So you can rearrange terms here in this third part of the equation block and get delta s over delta t. Now, what is delta s over delta t? That's the full circumference or a piece of the circumference by the amount of time it takes to travel that. So that's your speed, all right? So this numerator is V. And so omega is equal to V over R. Now this means that you can rewrite the, the centripetal acceleration and centripetal force in terms of omega, the angular velocity, all right? Because the R is filtered out uh, and you have a, a formula, basically, it takes V and filters R out of it by division. So that's how it works, all right? Now, last thing I want to point out to you before we dismiss, it's 420, um, is that this diagram, figure one in chapter 6-2, is pretty much related. You can see they have a position triangle in kind of reddish maroon and a velocity triangle in green. I have the same velocity, same same theory, it's di diagram slightly different, but you can s hopefully you can see the similarity. Now, before you dismiss, remember we're going to have a s special seating plan. We want to have as much time as possible. So cram your, you know what, in towards the center, so that people can get in and uh, study like study everything, as I mentioned on Wednesday. All right, you're dismissed. Come on up to the front if you have a couple questions. Everything up to today, my friend. Everything up to today, so up to 6.2. But there's parts of Chapter 5 that are on full bypass. If you go through my annotations and stuff, you'll see it. So, so yeah, it's, don't worry. What's hard to understand? We just did it. I mean, we just well, yeah. we did 6.2. We're going to be thinking about circles now. Instead of right triangles everywhere, we're, we're all don't get scared. Just just read my annotations and stuff. You'll be all right.
<laughs> and then you'll enter the mind of Minolta. Huh? You, by reading my annotations, you, you peer into this so-called mind up here. I figured out how to get on here, so I'll, I'll explain a little just bit. Do, yeah, I'll just do that. that. Yeah, that would be, that'd be fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Debbie, I have a question. Um, are you making a force diagram? Force diagram, yeah. You have it. You have, like, like have a free body, against, free body diagram. Yeah, 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 free, yeah, free body. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you have a friction going against you. Like the F, the, the if you if you're drawing, you know, you got the, the weight down and the front force, and whatever, and the friction goes back that way. The line that you do forward, or the direction of acceleration. Well, what I mean is like, does that line is that the F net? Because F net, F, like F total net force forward includes the friction. Yeah, if you have a net force that's forward, the acceleration will also be in the same direction. Yeah. Because yeah. F net equals M A. So whatever direction F net has, acceleration has the same direction. Matter of fact, that's how you know where your net force is. Because you can measure an acceleration. Keep in mind you have to this break it down. Yeah, you I mean you do a little bit of trig and stuff. Yeah. 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 But you wouldn't include friction in that. You in the yeah, you it, yeah. If if the number it, wise. if the friction might be Matt, Matt, come sit over here. Um, the friction might be a constituent force. You know, if it is, then you just got to deal with it. Would you draw square though, or would you just make? Well, in the free body diagram, yeah. And then the free body diagram, you lay out all your constituent forces, and then you do your math. You know, maybe a little trig. Whatnot to figure out what the net force is, and then you could do another diagram. It's not a free body diagram, but you put it put a dot and then one arrow for the net force once you figured it out. So you do your free body diagram, figure out the net force, do a second diagram with just the uh, net force arrow. So because the free because the free body diagram is going to have all your different varieties and flavors of forces, friction, normal gravitation. You know, space alien tractor beams. You know, whatever happens to be, you know, roaming the world, and but they all add up together to net force. That's Newton's second law. Mm -hmm. So, so you figure all that stuff out. You do your trig and stuff, and you count blo blocks of graph paper and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And friction. then you figure out you can figure out one force to replace them all. Which is this is the net force. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you have friction going one way, does it apply a force, the same force in the opposite direction, like normal force? Or no. Is just going Frictional to... force is always opposite the motion. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if you're moving to the right, the friction that you catch from the floor, you know, it doesn't matter what direction you go, but whatever direction you are going, the frictional force is the opposite direction. Yeah. Right. And you have to overcome that friction, and then all the rest of that on top of that is. That's, yeah. So that's you've got effect. yeah. So you've got to overcome that, and then yeah, and then you've got you know some level of friction that you've got to. So if you have 20 newtons of friction, you've got to have at least 20.00001 newtons of push force or pull force if you're hauling it uh, to get a little bit of acceleration. That's acceleration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, we were wondering, like, if you're making a force diagram, like, that line in the direction of acceleration, like, I saw, like, in the book, it was just friction and then F net this way. But I, I understand that, like, when you are pushing something, you have to overcome it. Yeah, I, I have a feeling. Now. Go back and look at that diagram because it probably isn't, like, exactly like you just said. Because there won't be any net force to the, in, in the, to the right. If there's not something, some push force, the free body diagram contains all the different forces from all the different sources. Okay, all the constituent forces. All right. Now you verbally described a free body diagram that only had one constituent force horizontally, the friction force. So my guess is that your description is incorrect. So go back and look at that diagram and see if there's something to the right. Wait, what do you mean by that? Because, well, if it's the friction is going to the left and then the net force. Yeah, if there's a net force to the right, then there's got to be another force, another somebody pushing 
somebody pulling. That's greater than your net force. That's that's great. That's greater than the. No, the net force is not a constituent force. It's the net force. The constituent forces are all the various forces that happen to be acting. Friction from the floor, you know, the 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 uh, professor pushing on the car. Uh, somebody, you know, ties a rope and they haul from the front. They pull on it. Think of like this. Think like a bank account. Let's say you put a hundred dollars in at the beginning of the day. Throughout the day, you buy lunch, you have some coffee, you make right? Purchases. Yeah. And then, like, so the friction, for example, and like that down forces, up force, for example, would be those purchases you make that are negative on your bank account. And the main force pushing it is like that money you put in the day. No, here's an even better example. Say you say you deposit a hundred dollars of cash, yeah. and then you deposit your paycheck, you know, two hundred fifty dollars. Now you got three hundred, and that so that's two constituent to the right, all right. And then you got various things you buy during the day, you know. And those the, those withdrawals would be the negative. Yeah. 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 So the net force would be hopefully positive, unless you're broke. You yeah. Know. Then you start getting those penalties and stuff. <laughs> it was thirty five dollars. Oh, was yesterday. Uh, was you did? Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. You were napping. Huh? You were you got caught napping. I did. No, it caught up to me. I was buying yeah. all this stuff, buying flowers and stuff. Yeah. That's not good. Pretty girls. Terrible. Terrible. No, but friction got too high. Yeah, friction's always hard.